I remember my very first computer, which you won't know, you know about this, is a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. This is like 1982 or something like that. Um, and I remember having a computer in the house for the very first time. Um, just like I remember having um, a video player for the first time, a CD player and um, a mobile phone. And technology becomes something you have to buy and it's expensive and you buy into it. A good teacher will be one who will take the risk to try out something and it might very well work and sometimes it probably won't work. Um, but you learn from that process. The technology is, is developing so quickly, there is no way a school can develop a curriculum or even a country can develop a cur curriculum to deal with this because by the time they do, because these things take time to develop, it'll be out of date. What initially sparked your passion for English? teaching and how did your journey lead you from London to Malaysia? Okay, um, so English teaching is, is probably the strangest one because I, when I was in university, I originally was going to uh, take IT as it was then. I mean, this is way back in the 80s, so it was probably called something else, but I found um, technology quite simple. Uh, that sounds weird because it was, uh, I'm not a mathematician or anything like that, but I, I found it very easy to do and it wasn't a challenge. And I think maybe with hindsight it might have been a mistake, but I felt English was something where I could deal with complex issues. And I think I was only saying to someone the, the other day, actually, I had a lesson and in it we spoke about biology, we spoke ab about issues to do with um, viruses, we spoke about uh, elements of politics and all that through English and I could be an art teacher, I could be a religion teacher, a theology or whatever, but English was the one that came out as touching more sensitive things and I think, I mean I've been a form tutor for, for many many years and there is a bond between students and their form teacher and especially their English teacher's form teacher which is somewhat different. It's not to disparage any other subject but we talk about all kinds of stuff and very often we lay our emotions quite raw, quite quite clear for everyone to see and talking about our own experiences which may not be as easy to do in certain other subjects which are about facts and our issue is in, in English is about emotions. Um, the second part of the question was about bringing me to Malaysia. I mean, that's, that's quite a long story. I was working in the UK for about 20 or so years. I was a teacher trainer. I worked in a couple of schools for a very long time, about 12 years, one, 14 years for another, so it's more, more than 20 years. Um, and trained lots and lots of teachers. And I realized I didn't want to become a deputy head teacher. That was kind of the next step. And yet at the same time, I would, felt very guilty because I was in a department where there were four, four people who had been with me for 14 years and none of them had been promoted because they all wanted to be in that position. And I realized, well, something has to give. I can't do this forever in the same way. And then my daughter was of an age where she was going to university and that freed things up. And I realized, you know, I, I can make this move. And so moved to work in Putrajaya, which is the Malaysian administrative capital. Worked there for a couple of years and then worked in uh, Jabara down south during COVID and all that business. And Malaysia became the place because we'd gone to Malaysia so often. Um, I was very used to it. And the system was very much a British education system. And quite often I, I'm in, in a classroom and it's only when I, step out into the heat outside and say, like, oh, I'm in Malaysia. Everything else could be in a British classroom. Yep. Uh, I think I think it's personally because of the colonial aspect of because, like, you know, Malaysia was originally colonized and occupied by the British Empire. I, you years. know what? I think it's also the reverse because I, I worked in schools which were very, very multicultural. And so the classrooms were made up of people from all different cultures. And so it's very familiar. Um, I think if I'd been someone who worked in a school which if they exist, which are predominantly white and English, I wouldn't get that same sense. 
But because of that, because working in London is a multicultural thing, it's only the climate that changes. Um, and that's, that's been good. I mean, there's been, been lots of very good aspects. I have to say, and this goes to the topic at hand, the technology aspect in Malaysia has been way better than what I experienced in the UK. Probably because it's been independent and, and private, um, but also because a lot of students are very keen to focus on that. In the UK, it's not quite the same thing. Um, so I've actually learned as a teacher, I probably learned more in my first year to do a technology than I did in like 20 odd years in the UK because there were so many restraints. Yep, uh, I believe that uh, Malaysia in uh, many ways is definitely behind the world, but it's also ahead in many ways too, especially in the education system, mm -hmm. with a lot of the classrooms are much better equipped than first world countries, as yep. we've seen with, um, you know, the USA, the UK, France, Germany, all these countries technically in their education system they are far much behind because malaysia's education is mainly privately funded compared to these uh countries where they're all funded by the government and it's a more popular choice to study the government or a state school in contrast to in malaysia here where it's more common to send your child into a privately funded institution or an international school so um in that ways I mean, I'll give you an example, because in school I worked in Putra Jai, what, what we often would have to do as teachers would be to decide, are we going to use Google or Apple or Microsoft for a particular task? So even, even like a word processing task, it would depend on what your purpose was. If you were being collaborative, if you want to work offline, if you wanted to format in certain ways. And that was something that never, ever occurred to anyone in the UK, that you'd actually have to make that decision and then choose it for a particular reason. And so I'm that very conscious of which app, which process I'm using, because it has, all of them have different purposes. In the UK, you don't, you're not given that. You're, you're told, okay, the school uses Microsoft, and that's that. You, you, you don't ever touch Google or anything else. Yep. Um, I mean, that that is... Uh very interesting thing because like with you know with money because of how much more well funded these institutions are there's so many more options available for both teachers and students and both teachers and students can work with a platform which they're more comfortable with where i've seen that uh, i'm not trying to you know uh demean anyone here but i would see that uh especially the teachers in general are more familiar with the microsoft platform in in, in a way because it's a much more easier one it's like compared to the macbooks where the students you know in in schools they prefer to use apple or macintosh it, which is so it's, it's just always just a divide where i've seen many teachers complaining that oh they can't do this because they're not familiar with the you know how the macintosh system works because they've always worked on windows so i've seen that where in students because of how many more opportunities and options they have available at this stage they are definitely familiar with Windows, but they always opt in for Apple and they're happy to work with both, but they've always seen that if they choose, they always go with the Apple um, system mm. compared to the teachers who, if they were given the choice to choose, they would most likely go with the Windows software. So I believe there is that um, difference. Beyond your professional endeavors, what are some aspects of your personal life that have significantly shaped your perspective on education, technology, and the evolving role of AI shaping the future of English education? It probably sounds quite quite self-absorbed to, to say, because I am mixed race, because I come from a culture which is mixed in lots of different ways, that's had a massive effect. I think in the UK it had an effect in that I was able to communicate with students who were very similar um, in their background, they were, they were from mixed cultures and so forth. It also has another side, which it makes it in some ways a disadvantage that students from a background like my own, which my father was working class, my mother was an immigrant, and so they had to build up their identity essentially and their, their life from, from scratch. And that's meant that technology represents lots of things. I mean, it, it, it's expensive. I remember my very first computer, which you, you, you won't know, know about this, is a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. 
it's like 1982 or something like that. Um, and I remember having a computer in the house for the very first time. Um, just like I remember having um, a video player for the first time, a CD player and um, a mobile phone. And technology becomes something you have to buy and it's expensive and you buy into it. Now, I think now living in a country which in some ways is very much in advance of America and, and Britain, in other ways is still developing different aspects. And technology is a key part of that. It is in some ways almost like a magic wand that can help people develop. Um, that is why it's so vital it's taught within school. Now, that then raises a question as to how that's done because you, you have your IT subject and even today within the school now, there aren't enough computers for the teachers who want to use them, yeah. um, particularly for year seven, eight and nine who want to have their devices. So that's always going to be a problem in any school, it's not, it's not particularly to this one. Uh, so it means that we have to start rationing certain things. Now, ideally we'll have a situation where all students can bring in their own devices and use their own devices. And it's like bringing in a pen or a pencil case. It's a standard thing. But at the same time, we need to teach students how to use it and also the staff how to use it. I don't believe that ICT should be a separate subject. Um, I think coding should be, and that's a separate, separate thing. But ICT is used everywhere. Information, communication, technology is used in every subject in different forms. Um, and I've lost count of the number of times that uh, younger students have asked if they can quickly look at their device to research something and they needed it there and then. And I've let them do it for a couple of minutes because they needed that information and then they can apply that information to what they're doing to find something out. Um, so technology is like a, as vital as paper and pens and so on. It's, it's like when you think of utilities in your house, you have water and you have electricity and the internet um, is as vital now. Um, and it needs to be seen in that way, not as an other thing that we don't do. I think we've been through a phase which has been that way. Some teachers said, oh, I don't do computers, I don't do the internet. And even now there are teachers in, in, in the school I'm in mean now who say that. Yeah, um, that. People younger than me who just do, don't use computers. Um, I think we're at a, at a stage where that's no longer an option, that, that it needs to be fundamental for every aspect of what we do. And AI is going to kickstart that even even harder. Yep. Uh, like the private institutions, especially uh, even government schools, they're going to start investing in their teachers to get qualifications on how they can actually learn these skills, so that they can first of all be more relatable to their students, and so they can also improve learning outcomes. You know, technology in many ways can help um, explain concepts much better and let me just share you a personal experience here because I used to take ICT as a subject in my previous school and ICT wasn't just ICT it was like it was pretty weird what we used to do is learn how to use word how used to, how we used to use like powerpoint and like we're learning things which are going to be redundant soon like yeah. there's no point learning this we're meant to learn on how we can use technology overall and leverage it for the future because technology is so rapidly changing a textbook a textbook published two years ago or even a one year ago is going to be irrelevant in another year because there's going to be so many advances and ict is a subject which cannot really be taught in a book it needs to be practical it's a very practical subject which needs to be implemented in lessons I, like I, you just I would said. say it is it is a tool it's it yeah. exactly that we don't we don't really teach handwriting anymore as such i mean yeah. it's something i do now and then would students have issues with it but it, yeah. it's no longer something we do and i think computers are like that i i i studied computer so what do they call it computer studies i think it was called um when i was doing my equivalent of, a, of GCSEs a very, very long time ago. And absolutely everything in it is obsolete. There is nothing I've gained from that whatsoever. And I think, as you say, that's the same now. But using the technology here and now, using Word and using these other things in the lesson, that's a vital thing. But that doesn't mean another subject. I, I had a year eight class today and they did not know that Google Docs automatically saves. 
and it's such a basic thing and that they were saying how can i say this and I said, have they never used it before have they been in a school that uses technology and they've never actually done this in school so um there, there are issues and yep. the problem Definitely. we're going to encounter is that the technology is, is developing so quickly there is no way a school can develop a curriculum or even a country can develop a cur curriculum to deal with this because by the time they do because these things take time to develop it'll be out of date yep. um it's not like shakespeare that's going to be around for a very long time um it's something that's always progressing yep. um so exactly it means we we can't teach it in that in that form we have to look at it in a different way yep so in light of what you've shared in your experience working globally what shifts have you noticed in how technology is integrated into the English education? And how has it influenced the overall education system? I, th I think it's the unifier. It, it is, as I said, having a mixed race background, being in mixed cultural, really mixed areas, working that kind of way has meant that students who are not part of the, the elite within a country are still able to use technology to bridge that gap. I think there, there has been for a long time the sense in Britain particularly that a certain elite go to certain universities or certain schools and they become the government and so forth. Um, but technology can, I believe, bridge that. Now, we, we had an instance last week, in fact, it was Boris Johnson saying that he had lost something like 5,000 WhatsApp messages during COVID. And his explanation was nonsensical. It was, it was, oh, the the internet went down and then it came up again, and five thousand messages vanished, That's not which not makes no sense. sense. Yeah, no sense at all. Um, it's not how WhatsApp works either. And yeah. he claimed things like, oh, he changed his phone, and therefore they were they were lost because he changed his phone. But again, that's not how that works. Yeah, everything scored on like like on the cloud, and it, it exactly. migrates exactly. if it changes like. Nothing there, are other no, yeah. there are other reasons. No, there are other reasons why he's lost those messages. But um, yep. so they're using those excuses. But technology, uh, as we saw with the kind of, kind of revolutions in the Middle East a few years ago, it can help. I mean, it can help shape societies. It can help develop ideas. It can help share things. But it can also be incredibly negative, as we've seen with Twitter and X or whatever. And how American elections have been run, British elections have been run, elections around the world, that technology is a tool and it all depends on which person is using the tool. That's that's the issue. Yeah, like Uncle Ben said, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And, you know, well, with this technology, technology... <laughs> that's funny it, because it, <laughs> you said Uncle Ben, and I know you mean Spider-Man. There are three Uncle Bens I could think of. One is the guy who sells the rice. One is Uncle Ben. I think it was a bear. I think there was a 70s program with a bear. We always called Uncle Ben. And then, yes, there's Spider-Man. Spider yeah. And technology is essentially this powerhouse, which, if used rightly, yeah. if used with the correct intention, you know, it can revolutionize the industry. Mm -hmm. Like, it, like not only this educational industry, but every single industry. And I also wanted to add, in particular, to your point where you said like a certain class is associated with a certain university. I would say it's most likely due to trends. Like if you see with Harvard, we see that a lot of the presidents currently attended Harvard, and we see with Oxford, Cambridge, it is that pretentiousness that associate people like oh, people often go to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, or always those chin up people. And I would say to an extent that is true. But I would say that because times are changing, they're opening up, they're diversifying the student body. I, I think they are, they are, but unfortunately the elite that we have in many countries comes through particular routes and, and Britain yep. is a prime example. I mean, so many people have been in the Bullington Club and uh, I mean, David Cameron and others are a part of that very small clique. Yep. Um, yep. And it does, I mean, my hope, my hope is that Technology is a way to overcome that, um, yep. but it will it will take a long time to be able to get to that point. Yep. So, with the rise of artificial intelligence, especially in education, how do you believe AI is reshaping the future of English and literature studies? I think once again, it is a problem that I mean, teachers are talking about it constantly. They, in many ways, are wary. 
uh, because literally they say something one week and the next week is entirely different. Um, it's going to make a lot of things we do very quickly obsolete. Um, example being reports. I, I did reports recently, as many people did, uh, put in some information into an AI thing and it came out and did the reports and it was totally correct. Um, things could be changed to make it a little more personal, but that can change over time. Then it comes to the question as an English teacher, particularly of writing, because we, we teach the mechanics of writing, of how to use punctuation and how to spell. But if you are using an AI which can correct those things for you, then what are we actually teaching? Because the students don't need that information. They'll have it corrected instantly anyway. I would argue that what we as English teachers should be doing is teaching two major things. One is creativity. And the other one is oracy, to actually be able to speak and communicate. I think in both of those instances, those are things that we use very often and are overlooked. I think the British curriculum overlooks speaking and listening quite severely some years ago, where they, there used to be a program where, where you do speak and it would be involved group work, pair work, and all kinds of things. And that was cut down completely into simply presentations. You do presentations because that's about business. And the people behind it believed that that was the most important thing to do for business. But speaking is essentially our core way of communicating. Yeah. Um, people speak probably much more than they write or read. And yet we're not teaching it in the same form at all. And people also judge you very much from how you speak. I mean, Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion does, does this marvelously way. You can judge a person by their accent, by their dialect, by how they, they talk. And this doesn't change because of AI, it's still fundamental. Um, what does change is how we research, um, how we collect data and information, and how we put that information together. Um, I think I mentioned to you that I, I did a course recently, about it was about grief therapy, and the course was a year-long course, and I did it in a, a month. Yep, not because that. I was cutting corners, but because AI helped me to summarize documents. It helped me to go over what I'd written and make sure it was focused, make sure the language and grammar were good, make sure I was repeating myself. And so I, I did the course, I absorbed everything, I knew exactly what I was talking about, and passed the course done. And for me to do that in such a short space of time then makes me wonder, well, okay, we're teaching the GCSE curriculum, um, and how much of that could be done like that? And, and some of coursework and things, um, all those elements. The problem is, in the UK, they've gone away from coursework. They've moved to examination. They don't trust coursework at all. And I think AI will make it even worse. Yep. Um, I, I see a time when there'll be no coursework anywhere, but not in IGCC or GCC or A-level or anything. It'll only be examination. It is, it is a very valid point because, like, I've seen many people around me itself, like, you know, due to mm. sheer laziness, not because they're busy or anything, they opted to you know, use chat GPT as their yeah. coursework, especially with the most recent one for when we were doing a street corner named Desire by yeah. Tennessee Williams. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of people use chat GPT. I'm not sure Absolutely. if they were um, caught by it, but their entire essay essentially was signed, sealed and delivered by yeah, chat yeah, GPT. I, 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 this is the thing, I've looked at that and they, they have clearly used that because their grades are way higher than they would have been normally. But at the same time, um, chat GTP at the moment would get a grade C and that's pretty obvious. The bits yes. that got the higher grade, such as giving wider reference in, such as giving personal opinion, which is key to this this particular question, that is what raised a grade. Those people who got the grade C didn't do those things. So there are ways to check it, but I, I think what will happen is it will shift towards examinations, but that causes a problem because all examinations are done by hand simply because there is not enough technology to allow you to use a computer. And yet you do your examination and then in the real world, you never write anything by hand ever again. You, you use a computer, you use your phone, whatever. And so it's entirely artificial. But you go in, you sit down, you write your examination with your hand using a pen, that a lot of people don't hold correctly now because it's not no need to. I, I, yeah. I used to teach people how to hold a pen and now I look at classes and the entire class is holding their pen incorrectly um, because they only use it when they go to an English lesson or they only use it when they go write something geography or something. And 
the moment they leave the school, they're not going to be using a pen ever again. Yeah, it is definitely a big problem. So I have this question to ask you. So as a leader in English education, mm-hmm. how have you creatively incorporated technology to drive innovation in teaching methods and curriculum? It's a couple of things. One is developing how we communicate using slideshows and information, convey information to students. Um, you can use technology to particularly to work with dyslexic students, with visually impaired students, to actually let them communicate more effectively. Mm-hmm. It's also to simplify ideas, to make sure they're able to be shared more readily, to share between people within a department, to work collaboratively, to work together in ways which we couldn't before. Where it used to be we, we could only work together if we were actually physically in a meeting. Now, we actually work together all the time through chats, through sharing documents, through looking at different things in that that way. And that, that's much better than, than before. Um, it means that contrary to what some people might think, technology has made us more social, more, more collaborative, uh, not less. That we can take a document and all add our bits and pieces to it or put information together or share ideas in ways which we could never have done just a few years ago. So there's that element, and the other side is to do with research and finding information and the fact that the internet allows you to do that. I Once again, showing my age, when I did my degree, um, we didn't use the internet at all. There was, it was in this early days. We actually used books and had to research using books. And I remember buying some very expensive books, which I used for one essay, and, and there was like crazy prices because that was the only way you could do it. Now I can find those exact same books online. Um, and as a poor student, I had to pay a lot of money. And now I can just get it for free and, and yep. do the research. So I, I would say that the students I teach nowadays even at A level, IB level, GCSE level, whatever, are much more intellectual than my generation was at the same age. Um, They know more information, they understand things in ways uh, which are much more complex than we did. Um, And this whole idea that somehow education is dumbing down is precisely the opposite. Uh, having to do with so much technology, so much information, so quickly, all the time, and 24-7, that's, that's the thing, it's not turned off or something, has made this generation much more advanced. I'm sure the next one will be even more so. Yep, that is true. In light of what you've shared, as a school leader, how do you navigate the challenges and opportunities presented by technological advancements in education, ensuring seamless integration into the curriculum I think it's a case of role modeling things. It's a case of leading on it. It's a case of showing how this can be done. But it's also a matter of not being afraid to do something different, to do something unexpected. Um, There was, I remember uh, when there were school inspections some years back, and one of the things they were looking for was to do with teachers risk taking. doing things unexpectedly, not just reading from a script, not just teaching from something that's been done many times before, but doing something that extends ideas. And I think in, for example, the IGCC class, I mean, using things like referencing and uh, wider thinking, looking at literary criticism, that's A-level stuff. That's, that's not IGCC stuff at all. And so things are coming down further and further. and. It's the same, I mean, a literal version is to do with the English texts. There, there was a time when you wouldn't teach Shakespeare to year seven, and now Shakespeare is standing for year seven. And I can see it becoming more and more advanced, further down the scale. Um, but I think a good teacher will be one who will take the risk to try out something, and it might very well work, and sometimes it probably won't work. Um, but you learn from that process. So before we move on, I'd like to expand more on your mindset, but I also believe it's culture. So if you compare the Western culture and the Asian culture, we've seen that the Asian culture is more conservative in many ways, and it doesn't allow you to take many risks. And it's most likely due to a factor of financial security. But compared to the Western culture, we're seeing more often people are willing to, you know, invest 
in these risks, they are willing to try out. They understand that mistakes happen. And with these mistakes, they are more than willing to learn. And I think that's the difference currently in the mentality. But I see that as we continue to develop as countries, um, we would see that this um, mindset would definitely level off. But I think it's right now, it's due to that thinking also that creates that divide in many ways. I mean, interestingly, this morning I read something I hadn't even considered before, that English as a language is the only language where the pronoun I is a capital letter. Um, and that kind of emphasizes how the self, the self-identity and the individual is so important within an English-speaking culture. And, and the stereotype is then that in Asian culture it's more collective and uh, uh, that may or may not be the case. But it does stress that particularly in Britain, Britain's very famous for innovation, not particularly good at making money out of it. That tends to be very in Japanese people who then make money from it, but inventing the internet, inve inventing musical trends, inventing literary trends, uh, the, so many of those things are from this small island of, of Europe. Um, that wasn't to do with to do with being a colonial power. It was to do with the fact that there is that risk taking. And I think music's a great example that you, you see David Bowie, for example, and the Beatles, Rolling Stones, all these big bands, singers, groups from there who've innovated and done something different and unexpected. And, and the question is, could it have come from anywhere else? Because other cultures certainly are very talented when it comes to music but that spark of innovation is that different thing and the example being the sex pistols which musically are not great but the innovation is there um and i think that's part of british culture i i, I don't know it was some time back but the olympic opening ceremony of 2012 i remember how everyone in britain said it was going to be terrible because it was chaotic and then literally at the very last minute, it turned out to be absolutely fantastic and people were really pleased and really proud and had no idea how this thing that they thought was going to be a disaster turned out to be brilliant. Um, and even now, looking back on it, we still can't figure this one out, how, how something that everyone thought was going to be the worst embarrassment ever turned out to be really actually <laughs> very good. Um, because then you had China afterwards who did everything regimented and it was, and it was fantastic. Uh, but that one you expected it to be. <laughs> the, yeah. the British way is, is chaotic and it brings up things you don't expect. Um, so I think when it comes to teaching, it's a similar thing. Uh, teaching is an art. It's, and it definitely is. Technology, technology is a tool that an artist can use. It's uh, a so, so weird mixed metaphor. But so. and, and particularly with the Indian culture, um, we Indians view teachers as gurus. Um, close to God, essentially, because knowledge is something which is very, very well respected, especially in the Hindu culture. So we never want to see any students. So we never really disrespect teachers because knowledge is something which we believe is everyone's fundamental right. And that's why we often associate teachers, especially mm -hmm. teachers out of every other professional available, the closest people or the nearest people to God, because you are sharing something which is going to be invaluable. You're teaching someone and that you, what you're teaching doesn't necessarily have to be oh if you're only teaching this to a particular race or you're teaching this to this particular mm -hmm. you know cast or anything but whatever you're passing on is considered invaluable and um it is definitely an art and it definitely also is a privilege in a way uh which everyone deserves to have so yeah See, it's interesting you say that because I, I mean, I've come from that kind of background as well. And it, it makes me uncomfortable because as a teacher, I, as an English teacher, uh, emotions are, are kind of always there and we make mistakes. And I think I'd say English teachers often own up to those mistakes or accept those mistakes and say, well, oh, misunderstood something, I did something the wrong way and whatever, more than other subjects. I mean, there are some subjects where there are actual facts that are there, whereas in English, it is a matter of opinion, it is a matter of arguing the case and I'm not talking about things like spelling and grammar, which are kind of set, but, but an interpretation of a text. And very often I play devil's advocate with students where I take an interpretation of a text that 
seems completely counterintuitive to what they expect, reading it in a totally different way, simply to provoke them to argue. Um, and because I've got the skills to do that, they, they could just say, oh, teacher's right, and therefore, but that's not the point. The point is, that's one opinion. Now what's yours? Um, but I have had students who have hated English for that exact fact that it's not clear cut, it's not black and white, it's not an absolute answer, it is just an opinion which could change like the wind. Yep. And we, we did that Shakespeare sonnet where Shakespeare was basically, yeah. uh, he wrote it as a woman, if I'm not mistaken, no, as a man. No, he, 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 he wrote it possibly. This is one interpretation for a man who's playing a woman as well. This is, uh, um, oh, what was it? The, the sonnet, I forget the number, but it, it's where he's, when it's written, some people suggest it was for a particular woman, but uh, some interpretations say it's for an actor playing that role. Um, and it therefore, at first looks like it's mocking romantic poetry, but it's, it's not. It's actually doing something else. It's actually showing what the actor's wearing, the wig and the fake chest and everything to be to be this role. Um, so it, it, it's playing around with language, but there's, there's no absolutes in English. There's no definites. Um, it's like this thing where they say about grammar. I mentioned grammar being being set in stone. It's not. Every, every grammar rule in English, there's always exceptions. So there's no rules. There's kind of general trends, but the whole A before E except after whatever, that, that thing that people learn, it's not true. Um, and so many things that people say, oh, yeah, these, this is how you do it, is not correct. In other languages, it might be. But English, because of how it is as a, an organic thing, is not set like that. Considering the rapid changes in technology, how do you think educators should prepare students for a future where technology plays a central role in their education and beyond? I think, as I said, we can't really do that. We can't. We can't plan ahead. What we can do is use now. We we live now. Um, yep. If we start second guessing technology, um, we'll be wrong. Uh, I don't think. I mean, people spoke about AI. I remember when I when I was actually trained as a teacher myself, we spoke about AI as a possibility, and it was basically like a fairy tale. And then last year it happened in a way that we didn't expect. And it directly affects education. It affects language, it affects how we communicate. It's core. Um, uh, so it's unexpected. What we must do is live in the now, use the technology we have now, and learn from it as we progress, um, yeah. rather than make predictions. Um, I, I think that that's the, the only positive way to do this, by, by embracing it. And uh, I also see that um, schools around the world, globally, are consistently developing policies which are anti-AI and yeah. are no benefit to anyone. Like, they should be embracing it. They should be using it to their ability. To it is the fear. It is the fear. I, mean, I mentioned this to you before that I remember being in a meeting some years back where I used my mobile phone and the principal in the school who took me aside and told me off to use a mobile phone in a meeting. And it was being used to write dates or record notes or something like that. But she did not understand that uh, and didn't understand it could be used as a tool to help. She thought I was sending messages or something, going on Facebook or something like that. Um, I, I think we, as teachers, we, we teach students all kinds of things. We teach them how to behave in class. We teach them how to act correctly when we speak, to take turns. One of the primary things in, in, in elementary school is to turn take. And I think we need to teach students how to use technology, that you can have your telephone, your mobile phone on the desk. It doesn't mean you're going to pick it up and order a pizza in the middle of a lesson. It means you will use it when you need to. You know how to be polite with it. You know when to do it and when to turn it off and when to make it silent. And I think, I mean, I have my mobile phone in class, it's on my desk and it never goes off, it never disturbs the class and, and it's because I know how to use it. Um, and I think the same is true of students and students learn very quickly and they should be allowed to do that. Um, so it is, as you, as you said, and I said, it's, it's embracing it, not being afraid. And I think the moment we ban something, the moment we say, no, we can't do that, we're not going to do that, we're, 
it, it creates a barrier because you know students will do it. We, we stop people using their mobile phones, which many schools do, and it's a big thing in many places. They're either going to secretly have it with them or they're going to find other ways to, to use that technology. So I, I think we're fooling ourselves if we think we can ban things in that manner. Yep, I, I do agree too. So with what you just shared, what advice would you offer schools looking to effectively incorporate technology into the classroom, aligning with the changing landscape and education? I think we need to be egalitarian in what we do. We need to treat people equally. We need to make sure that no student is disadvantaged, that all students have access to it. We have got the problem, as you mentioned, that particularly government funded schools have a problem with funding, with money. Um, and there's no way that many schools can afford technology to buy the right computers because by the time you do, they're already obsolete. Um, so we can't go down that road of, oh, the school is going to buy 150 computers for every student in the school and we're going to use them for the next 20 years. It, it, it won't happen. Um, so it means there needs to be a different approach. And I think it might need to be a kind of national approach where students have to have their own devices and if they can't afford it then there needs to be some kind of fund to allow them to do so so the money rather than going to the school to be spent on repairing the roof or something is used to help students who can't afford the technology to have that technology um, even today when we spoke about homework today and i was reminded of the very simple fact that if we issue homework there is no way anyone can guarantee you what each individual person is going to have. Some people have a nice quiet place to work and they'll be able to focus and do what they need to. Other people won't have internet connection, they'll be sharing a computer with, with other family members, they'll have to look after siblings, they'll have other commitments, so there'll be all kinds of things. And so then the next day, people come into the class and some of them have done their work brilliantly because they had all the, the right things to help them and others won't. And it's not because of their fault, it's because their circumstances have prevented them. And yet we will say, no, no, you've got a detention, you haven't done your homework, and therefore you have a detention, regardless of the fact they couldn't do it, because of whatever situation. And I, I think this old fashioned way of thinking, you know, we have to give homework all the time, it has to be done in this way. We need to think differently. We, we need to approach things differently and stop treating some students unfairly, which is what, what is essentially happening at the moment. Um, and technology is the cornerstone of this. We need to allow everyone access. And I also believe that um, students, apart from like, you know, with commitments and all, are also mm. being um, segregated on race, ethnicity. Yeah. I know I've faced quite a bit of this in the classroom itself, where when we were going on a residential trip, which really serves as a bonding uh, trip for all the students in the year group, for some reason, me and two other boys who were the only Indians in the entire year group were put together and they associated that, that just because we're Indians we're going to get along with each other but yeah. no that's not the reality I have friends who are Chinese <laughs> who are like it, 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 I know lots, lots of Indians who fight with each other all the time so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, and like just because I'm I'm uh, I'm an Indian or just because we all are Indian doesn't mean they're gonna just segregate us into different rooms. Like they're not even taking into account like everyone's like opinion on who to think they might you know they might actually personally like to be with. And in many ways, this also happens in the classroom. This was a school expedition, by the way, and this happens in the classroom too. Your partners, everything like your seating arrangement, everything matters. Everything influences your learning outcome where you sit in the classroom your position your partner your teacher too to a very like, huge extent all of these factors collectively make or break your education i think that's absolutely right i i, I think we kind of lived that exact experience i i i was toying with the idea of saying oh it's because malaysia has got its uh issues to do with race, but I, I don't think it, it's just Malaysia, it's not that. It's I, I remember a moment in school, when I was in school, where, as I said, a multiracial school in, in, in Britain, and I took my O-levels, so GCSE equivalent, and all of my friends at that point were Asian, everyone, because I, I was from a mixed race background, I look, I look Asian enough to be Asian, my brother looks white enough to be white and so we can we can tread certain ways 
And then I did my A-levels, and my A-levels were in English literature, English language, sociology, religion. No Asian kid was doing any of that at all. Suddenly, literally overnight, all of my friends became white in school because I was doing the subjects they were doing. Um, so, I mean, schools strive in some ways to have equality, but I think natural divisions, I mean, I, I don't want to really talk about it as being racism because it's, it's not as simple it's, as that. It's, it's, it's culture. It's like the really the it's mindset. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cultural. It's also who you are, think, oh, people will feel happier with people of their own culture together and so on. But as I said, if you don't come from that culture, then maybe it gives you an advantage in that you can see that for what it is. Yep. Um, I, when I was in school, literally all the children who had Pakistani backgrounds were friends, all the ones with Indian backgrounds were friends, Caribbean backgrounds were friends. They were in their cliques. Um, and that wasn't because the school was doing it, and it wasn't even because the country around was doing it. It was because in school that's kind of what happened. And so if you are not part of any of those cliques, you have issues, you either become independent, which is probably what I did, or you lose part of yourself so that you can then join another group. And I've, I've known people to do that, where they hide certain aspects of who they are so they can join in with the dominant culture, and, and that's their solutions. But they can't damn it, is what they do. I, I think that's a pretty bad practice because people should express who they truly are. They shouldn't want to actually fit in the bandwagon. Yes, I, that helps you in the short term. But I think it's easy for us to say that, but I, th I think every individual's experience will be different and, and yep. they have their own reasons for doing doing what they do. I just know that for myself, it wasn't a choice uh, like that. So but just coming back to technology, which is what this is about, it's technology can be the great kind of cl close the gap between people. It can bring people together. It can allow people to communicate across the world. It can make the world smaller. It can mean that people who have issues with their language can actually use AI to make their language equal to anybody else's. Um, and I, th I think that that's got to be a vital thing, that EAL learners can improve much more quickly by using AI to help them hone their language. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be a good thing. And I, I wanted to share this one thing because when you're talking about um, your A levels and your O levels, when like the stark contrast in yeah. the student body that you're studying it with, um, I read this uh, letter by a principal. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was stationed in the UK, and he basically sent out this letter not only to his school body but also on his social media platform. And I liked it in many ways because what he essentially said was to the parents that don't be mad that your student that your son got a B in mathematics because they might end up being a great you know singer in the future don't be mad that your son got a b or a c in music because they might be a great scientist don't judge them for these particular grades because that might not be something that they're passionate about and that's the same thing with culture that we we're originally talking about and then they start contrast and mindset where parents should not judge their kids on their particular performance in a test or of a subject which they're not passionate about because like say if i'm being judged on my musical abilities it might not be the highest compared to my stem passion right because every every child everybody has something that they're interested in and that is that interest that strives or that makes them to you know persevere and achieve their true goal and that is the kind of difference in thinking that really separates um the Western culture and the Asian culture. Yes, yes. How have your personal interests influenced your perspective on the evolving relationships between education, technology, and AI? I, I, I think as I mentioned about how I found technology quite easy to use, and I, in some ways, I think I'm. A, a, I have been a rarity I, when I've been head of department and when I've been in a senior role and so on. English teachers do not traditionally embrace technology, but I'm, I'm able to code, I'm able to use spreadsheets in complicated ways to deal with data and numbers. Not because I learned it in school, I hated it, the maths and 
of science in school, but I've learned in the job and I've learned how to use it. And I, I think when I became an English teacher, I never knew I would use spreadsheets and data as much as I do. Um, but but you learn, you learn ways to do it. I think for, for me, because I think in a particular way, a lot of the stuff I do has been very visual. It's been very much communicating ideas in ways which are not just a, a spreadsheet of numbers. I remember there was a head of English I came across who actually literally would give students a whole spreadsheet of all their grades, all their numbers and all their self grades and everything. And that was all it was, just a spreadsheet of numbers. And they'd have to work out, well, what grade are you and what, why are you there and whatever. And hated it completely because it meant nothing. Um, but you can convert that data into language, into language that makes sense, and then that language can target things and you can talk to people as human beings. It's the same information, it's how you transfer it, transform it. Um, there was a, a moment in Britain where um, Michael Gove, the Secretary of Education at the time, basically woke up one morning and decided there were no, no more grades or anything. So every school was suddenly floundering. That, Year seven, eight, and nine were no longer graded. Um, and then the question was, well, how do you report to parents? How do you tell them what your child is doing if you can't say a grade because every school hasn't got a grade now? Um, and lots of people did do all kinds of things. But the way to, we, I eventually did it in school I was in at the time was to simply to use language to say that this person's work is good or it's exceptional or it's developing or and start talking about the work rather than in, individual student. The problem with grades is people often say I'm a grade A and I'm a grade B, but you can't do that with words. If you say good, if you say this piece of work is good, the child will not say I'm good because that's a different thing. It's the work. It changes the language of communication. So taking data, using AI, to translate that into actionable ideas is the key thing. And it can be done because I've done it myself. It's not that complex to actually do that, to take information, to tell AI the scales, to tell them, to tell AI what, what it's about, and then to make it communicate in a way that parents can understand, students can understand. Um, that's our great challenge, to, to let students know what they're doing without saying levels of grades. Particularly, like what you pointed out when you said treat um, students as human beings, I would say yeah. that's what's really stood out about your teaching in particular. Or my opinion about teachers is if that teacher can relate to me or the students mm -hmm. on a personal level, that teacher's excellent because that shows them that they're empathetic, they care about their students a lot, they connect with them. And this it's also this connection which also drives the student wanting to improve their current you know score in the class or they wanting them to learn more it makes them more curious it this is the thing so, I mean, it's very kind of you, very, very kind of you to say that but it, it, it's always for me it's been how do you translate that grade into something that makes sense if you're a grade b what does that mean i'm not saying you're a grade b but, but for anyone what does it actually practically mean and how do you get from the B to the A to the A star or whatever numbers or grades, whatever it is. I mean, the grades and numbers mean nothing. They're, they're just a hierarchy. It's how do you improve those skills? English is wonderful because it's all about skills. It's, we can read any book. The content can change. We can read Shakespeare, Dickens, poetry, watch a film, listen to music, whatever. It doesn't matter what we're analysing or what we're thinking about. It's the skills of doing it which are important and that's yeah. the transferable thing I, I often say this when students say oh i hate english english is the only subject that it doesn't matter what you do in the future even if you stop speaking the language itself you will still use those skills uh, yeah. even in another language so it's the only one that's transferable in that same form and you will use it every single day yeah. um mathematics even though mathematics is a universal language as people say it, you don't necessarily use it every day, uh, but communication you do. It's essential to like er, er, like our general mm -hmm. living. Like uh, people also say that the early humans, because there are many many different types of you know, like human species, and we were the ones that survived. We're the more modern humans, is because they said that, uh, like scientists say that, our species in particular, the reason we were able to survive was because that we had developed communication skills much better. Or like we, we had verbal communication skills, even like compare if even if we're comparing ourselves to 
chimpanzees or gorillas, which are one of our closest ancestors currently, I think 97% of our DNA matches with them. It's more about that verbal and oratory skills that you just said previously that we have, which allows us to thrive in society, which they didn't really have. And therefore, we are on top of the chain, the food chain, essentially. Well, this is why, going back to AI, AI as we talk about it, it, was, it sounds like some, some kind of magical thing. But what it's done, and I think chat GPT, just by definition, it is chat, it is conversation, it is language, it is a language model. Yep. The technology has existed to do this for a long, long time, but it's only now that it's bridging the gap between the bits and bytes and binary code and human language. And it's not perfect at all. You can ask it all kinds of things. I do very often, and you can you can see the joints. You can see it's not there, but it's learning, and it will become second nature very very fast. But it's interesting that I mean, you, this interview is with me as an English teacher, and it is language which is key to technology working for us now. Um, yep. That's what's been the massive quantum leap so to speak the step forward and that it's technology that that ai can pass law exams it can pass examinations in university by using language um which in the end language is a kind of code but as i said english is a particularly obtuse code because it doesn't follow certain rules um but that, that's been the big step. I think that's why AI has become such a big thing now, because it's finally talking to us on the same level.